Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of EcomPay Talks. My name is Moishi Weingarten. I'm Chief Revenue Officer here at EcomPay and I'm excited to be joined by Claire Haskins, Head of Commercial Transformation here. So Moish, what have you got for us to talk about this evening? I think there's loads of exciting things happening in payments. Um, but I think what caught my eye more recently was uh, a bumper month for open banking in July. I don't know if you saw that. I think it was up uh, almost 10, 10% growth uh, in open banking. I don't know... A resident open banking expert, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on what some of the stuff triggering that? Yeah, so obviously we're talking about the UK specifically, but yes, um, I think that the, the UK has demonstrated a real ability to go from strength to strength in open banking, um, predominantly driven by the way that they structured the market to yeah. operate. Um, and whilst that centralised model has um, some limitations for expansion to other markets, um, it's definitely proven to kind of drive the standardisation that's that's driven transactions. And of course, the poster child was HMRC and the collection of revenue uh, debts, shall we say, that were that were owing. And open banking provided a really useful way for for people to be able to provide those payments. So. It's really kind of driven a, a use case and I think one that we can now replicate in lots of other places. So f for me, it's a super exciting topic. You know, and it's interesting you mentioned that because I saw the news about the um, kind of big jump we saw in July, kind of pre the summer. And I was wondering, you know, was there any specific drivers for that? You know, I don't think there's any particular tax deadlines or returns happening in July because of the use case you mentioned. But mm -hmm. Anything you think particularly has triggered it in July or is it just natural? Um, I think there's been a continual growth. So certainly over the last few years, we've seen progressive and quite stepped growth across um, month on month for, for the UK specifically. I guess there's a little bit of a tax mop up. So if you're Probably, overdue, yeah. then there's a little bit of that as you move into the summer. And then perhaps some of the things that we were kind of talking about in our pre-brief where we were thinking about you know, what's been happening around summer and people getting ready to go abroad and whether that's had any drivers on. Yeah, because I was thinking that, because if I think the areas or the verticals where we've, open banking is really bedded down in, is is in movement of funds, um, whether it's account loading of various types, um, remittance. So, yeah, I think there's a good chance neobanks like Monzo or Revolut or even TransferWise, anywhere where there's travel money and cards, could be just a spike in people you know, loading up, getting Forex or putting on travel money cards. I think that's true. Um, there was also the, what do they call themselves, JROC, so mm. the Joint Oversight Committee. Mm -hmm. um, they published their next steps for open banking as well, kind of earlier, back yeah. end of H, H2, H1, sorry. Yeah. Um, and I think that that possibly also stabilised what people's expectations are of what's going to come. So anybody that was being hesitant or latent maybe has started to, to move those projects forward with more vigour once that was sort of more certain and planned. Yeah. Um, and that's going to take us forward as we look to PSD3 and the expansion into the broader kind of ecosystem of open finance. So being able to bring in that or expand that very narrow scope that open banking had around current oh. accounts into savings and pensions and investments. And then that plays directly to what you were talking about in terms of money movement and wealth management. So that's where I think open banking starts to be a different proposition to what people have had historically. And I guess in the current economic climate, there's argument that people have been more reliant on being able to move monies around or to make monies work better for them. Oh, 100%. But it it's interesting we're talking about money movement, open banking, but there's so much talk about e-commerce, possibly retail and open banking. But we've seen a bit, you know, at e we have a couple of really nice retail examples of some merchants doing kind of, you know, their, their um, market leading and ahead of the trend a little bit. You know, there are, the way I see it, there are challenges from um, yeah, consumer adoption. Why should consumers use open banking for 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 retail on purchase e-commerce, regular e-commerce? You know, how do you facilitate um, things like refunds in a in a seamless customer experience? Obviously, we've built um, you know advanced solution behind that. Um, but even then, when you talk about, especially talk about pan European commerce, um, the challenges of I ban discrimination and moving funds between them, and then making sure you know it's not just about being able to integrate the banks, but having the local accounts behind it. What do you see in terms of growth for you know, moving away from money movement and loading and, and embedded finance, but just commerce? 
Um, do you think? Do you think we'll get there? Do you think it's going to have limited appeal? Very by country, it? All of the above, right? It, so, are we going to get there? A hundred percent. I'm a huge believer. Oh, really? And okay. I believe that um, open banking or open finance is going to facilitate ease of transaction, and that's the number one thing, right? If mm-hmm. it's easy, people will do it. And um, whatever else is true, the legacy of those bank relationships that people have had since they were literally children and have grown up with gives them the confidence to be able to put their faith in a process that um, is going to help them to to transfer money in a way where they don't feel that they're as open to fraud as they have heard or rumoured on on cards, etc. Um, I'm super proud of the way that EcomPay has embraced mm, open banking definitely. as part of the proposition. Yeah because I think so many acquirers were really scared that they were going to get disintermediated and so That's didn't true. want anything to do with it and have spent a lot of time, you know, stirring the rumour mill to, to to create negative press. And the, sch- the schemes as well were like trying to figure out what's their role in the, in this new world. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge change of culture and life for the schemes, right? 100%. They've had to find a new place in the ecosystem. But I think that then plays through to where we started, where we talked about the UK have done this well, um, it galls me a little bit, but the, the UK have done this really well mm-hmm. and they have um, optimised the opportunity of standardisation and that's where Europe missed out. So Europe are behind because they didn't embrace the things in the same way. And so from an e-commerce perspective, yes, if a, if a merchant can offer more choice for ways of payment, we've already seen the stats that you know, the number one reason why people drop out of the buying process is because their preferred method of payment yep. isn't available. So the answer is, can you have one thing? No. Do you have to have them all? Absolutely. And the more of those that you have in your stable, the more choices you have, ergo, the more addressable market you have. So I think, yes, it has a place and it's definitely an enabler for e-commerce and other payments. But PSD3 should, just your point about um, standardization across Europe, PSD3 should help standardise and drive things across Europe, you reckon? Yes, but they're coming from a long way behind. Yeah. No. So, but, but to be fair to the rest of Europe, I think UK is one market, right? This is the common challenge, you know, outside it, you know, we make, right? Europe is a lot of different markets. You know, not all of them are on, you know, in the Eurozone, not yeah. all of them are connected to SEPA. Um, there is a little bit of the IBAN discrimination, but even then the, the way the... Uh, Interbank payments are set up for consumers. Differentiated pricing for SEPA versus SEPA inst. You know, it's controls in place or security. You know, anti fraud controls. Um, you know, if it's being you know sent to another market. So there's there are challenges in Europe besides which standardization will help. But I think it's uh, it's just more complicated because it's more than one market. It's definitely true. Definitely true. And the big players like the the INGs, the Credit Suisse, those people who are playing across all of those markets, they'll be the ones who demonstrate how to do this. True. And then the others will be able to follow. But I think that um, there's massive opportunity for Europe. It just doesn't have the same impact that in international markets. In international markets, there was a gap. There wasn't a universal banking mechanism that worked yep. for at least the majority um and that's why it hasn't been needed as much in europe so they were able to resist it more and, and yeah. all of the kind of obstacles and challenges have, have, have kind of played out so i think the uk approached it differently and the cma9 was a huge driver in that i still i'm not i'm not fully bought in on the retail stuff i think it's going to vary by market right i think it's really interesting to see and, and your point is before on if it's simple, people will use it. Hmm. The cards together with like the wallets, so Google Pay, Apple Pay, it's a very, very slick one-click purchase experience. Yeah. I think you know, when you know, open banking and so those payment journeys were being created, Apple Pay, Google Pay hadn't really been adopted. I was like, you know, open banking is slick, you know, it's a faster journey. But nowadays, in you know, with with one click, Google, Apple Pay, with Section 75 protections, I think markets like the UK might not necessarily transition that much for retail, but other markets which have been card heavy, central European markets, I, I think it'd be interesting to see. I think, I think it's going to it, be very cultural on you know, the level of adoption. I do think we'll see a bump in retail. Um, I, I agree with you. I'm, a, I'm an Apple girl, I'm afraid. Um, but <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> uh, 
And, and even now, if I can't pay by Apple Pay, it means I have to walk down the corridor to fetch my handbag, to fetch my card, which is hugely inconvenient. Yeah. So that's not happening. So I have to really want something to want to buy, but that's, that's a demographic. Open banking, because it's banking, covers so many more people. So it just opens the, the kind of the door that little bit wider. So whatever your preferred payment method, then you've got that at your disposal. It, it's then. definitely got to be an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could all agree. I might but, even be able to teach my dad. But you mentioned Apple, so that's a good point. Other things latest in the news with Apple is Apple um, tap to pay. So Apple's, and actually they bought, didn't they buy MobiWave? Was that ages ago, the original company they bought who were, who were kind of pioneering pin on glass and being able to take payments on your phone? Yeah. Um, so the tap to pay, and it's it's been quite a few announcements of partners, uh, I think in the UK and Europe, who kind of said, yes, we've enabled Apple Pay, uh, Apple tap to pay. Um what are your thoughts? I think that could be quite quite um, a catalyst in, in going cashless. I, I would agree with you. I think um, well, Apple Pay are the original inv innovators, right? When, when they, they do something, they manage to take the tsunami of people with them because mm. people want to be kind of trust in the technology and want to follow it. The concept of pin on glass has been around for a really long time and yep. people have been very, very nervous about putting your pin number into somebody else's phone, you know, where is it? you know, memorizing the the placement of the sure, numbers sure, and yeah, the yeah. fingerprints on the on the screen, et cetera. But I just think that over that time, that probably for me was back end of 2016, maybe working out in, in Eastern Europe and people were nervous of it, even though it existed because it was unfamiliar and because they were worried about fraud. I just think that the whole transformation to paying by card in any environment, um, the pandemic, so many merchants now, particularly retail merchants, where yep. you go and the first thing that you see makes my little heart flutter is, um, we do not accept cash. Yes. So good. Now they're feeding the industry that, that, that we all work for. And I think that that has kind of changed people's behaviors, patterns, and, and has increased confidence and familiarity with these things. So when somebody says, put your pin into my phone, they're slightly less cautious yep. about it and much more I think an understanding also, of how also these psychologically, if you give me a tablet, I'd be more happy to tap it in a tablet. I don't know why the phone looks like it's your personal device and a tablet mm -hmm. not. But it but the other thing I think for SMEs, you know, it's a, there's there's cost savings as well. You know, they're normally paying, you know, monthly fees to rent hardware. So being able to get rid of the hardware, being able to set up quickly, instant provisioning so you can sign up, um, get auto kind of um uh, onboarded and then just you know, over the air. Uh, set up and, and transition the software. It's pretty. It's pretty cool. And it provides, I think, that border case for, um, you know, you've got your traditional point of sale merchants, physical terminal, yeah. pay in store. I'm here and I'm, you know, my card's with me or my phone's with me. Then you've got the e-commerce world where it's all very remote and and that's been managed. And then you've got these kind of periphery use cases. So. Wagamama's is a great example of this. You go in now into a physical environment where you were traditionally paid in store and you're still paying in store, but now you're paying through a QR code. So actually you're paying through an app. So now that's e-commerce. Yeah. And what they need to do is just kind of blur the edges for those people who are absolutely determined that they're going to pay while they're there in front of a cashier, et cetera. So it's tr it, the whole thing is transitioning. And I find that Really exciting. And the original pioneers of kind of getting rid of the point of sale was Apple in their stores, right? <laughs> they came around with the tablets and then, you, and then they, you, you've had other businesses take it as queue busters where there's big queues on sales days going, you know, work the queue. So, yeah. Um, you can even do it in Marks and Spencer's. And if you can do it in Marks and Spencer's, if you do it in Marks and Spencer's, you can do it anywhere. Yeah. yeah, no, 100%. But what's exciting for me, you know, I, I was starting payments like 16, 17 years ago when it was all the hype about NFC and mobile payments. And, you know, the concept of making a payment with your phone was cool, but what could really be revolutionary is taking a payment with your phone. And, you know, and taking a payment by phone, if you think back to, you know, Square has been around a little over, I think about 2010, and there was the unicorn for a night power technologies in the UK, who have got their great story. But, you know, and then you had Izettle and Sum Up and all kind of born around that time. Yeah, all those um, micropods. But it was, you know, we know Apple bought MobiWave, you know, a few years back, right? So it's been waiting for the mainstream. And if you look at what happened with making payments with your phone, right? There were lots of different technologies. I remember in, in Turkey, they were putting stickers on the phone, right? You know, for, for almost 18, 20 years ago, right? Um, 
but it only really accelerated if you follow kind of the Gartner cycle of hype. It really became mainstream when the scheme, it went, when, sorry, when the handset providers, you know, um, Android, uh, Apple kind of did it. And so now looking here, we've been kind of taking payments, SMEs are doing it with little plug-in dongles. And I remember some of the bigger, more legacy providers doing it. But I think this is the, this is, this is now the mainstream really bedding in what's been kind of around for 10 years, um, this, this technology coming in. So it's exciting. Um, you know, and, you know, keen to see what it does and natural erosion of cash transactions without forcing anything and still giving people choice. But I think it'll be, it'll be interesting to see that evolve. Do you think we'll ever see a cashless society? Yeah, I do. I think, you know, and, and we'll touch on that, you know, maybe CBDCs and, and, and the digital currencies coming in. I think, you know, it's generational. Um, so you, it takes a few generations for it to pass through to get that level of comfort. But um, I do think I do think we'll see that. At least physical cash. It might become digital yeah. cash, right? Where do you sit on that central bank digital currency, the CBDC? I mean, that's just the whole whole crypto conversation, you know, and, and crypto acceptance. Um, so digital currencies in general, um, extremely powerful lot of options, right? Should merchants and are merchants interested in, in taking digital currencies? I think merchants, especially the forward thinking ones, are they're interested in testing and learning it, which is why actually we built our own in-house solution so merchants can accept um, you know, a few different types of cryptocurrencies and you know, we actually don't touch it, it cuts settled in fiat, we can do that to the merchant. And, and that's fine, I think, to be able to test and I think it's important as a payment service provider to be able to offer the ability to kind of R and D and do this, do, do those kind of things. I think, though, for the mainstream long term growth, for merchants to accept untethered or non fiat backed digital currencies, there's a bit of a currency fluctuation risk, um, which they've got to consider. They've got to really think about what the benefits are to them. If it's if the payment provider can provide it, you know, any time settlement kind of good, but you know, what is their consumer demand? The consumers are they going to be aware of the protections? But I think when you talk about CBDCs. Um, it's exciting. I think it's inevitable, but it's far, far bigger, more complex. You know, we've talked about for years already, right? And ever, I think the tech, the, the really smart people, far smarter than me who know the technology and we can do this and that, but it's an entire ecosystem which has got to be put together. Mm. Um, so I'd like to see it happen. And I think that could at least move from the physical cost of generating cash and, and, and physical banknotes and coins away. Um, and I think in the world, the digital world we live in, it makes sense. At least from P, from a P to P perspective, for me to send you know, give you money like I do in the real world today, I should be able to do that seamlessly. Um, so yeah, I'm a little, a little yeah, I'm a, I would say in general, I'm a believer. I don't believe it's it's going to happen overnight. I think it's going to it's a it's a bit of a bigger project than some of the big the big fans are. I think it's still struggling though, right? With its kind of um, reputation might be the wrong term, but um, a little bit. Like every new technologies that came in, people were really cautious and nervous. And crypto, particularly, has been kind of tarnished with this shadows of the Silk Road. It's only used in places where people don't want money to be but traceable. You, but, but that's, but that's it's I think. got all of that kind of legacy to overcome to become a, a kind of a credible, replaceable mainstream payments process. And I think that's where the central bank stuff comes in because when the Bank of England say, "Oh, this is okay," you kind of got to go with it. Um, and it's a digital currency now. I think crypto, even the name crypto, is being a little bit you know, tarnished, as you say. So these these are digital currencies, and they're truly, to be honest, even without central CBDCs coming, so central bank digital currencies coming in, we have um, there are a number of stable coins, USDC, USDT, um, you know, and 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 you're yeah, tethered to to either a basket of currencies or USD. Do you think though, if each of these central banks are building kind of their own? central currency that we're actually it was something I think about when I can't sleep um is this the sort of thing that's actually driving back in each country having its own currency whereas actually we'd gone quite a long way towards certainly across Europe standardization of a single currency across the eurozone and you know has that whole trying of you know is 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 one of my UK central bank currency tokens worth the same as a US one, or is it? So, yeah, I guess as as people on the street, we think, why can't there be a, a digital currency for the world, a global digital currency? And that's what Bitcoin was going to be. But mm. there's the concept of seniorage, which is 
actually quite profitable for central banks and issuing currency. So it's the, it's the revenue they earn are essentially lending, lending the currency out. And so I think the central banks are going to be, they're not going to want to give that up too quickly. Um, and there's a lot of value in having their own marked fiat, you know, kind of fiat version of, of a digital currency. So there, there, there's more um, commercial drivers in play rather than altruistic ones to like, let's make a, you know, a currency for for the world. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, there's some interesting factors to look into on that one. But the tracking and traceability, I, I, I think it kind of, you know, huge stereotype. But if you're if you're the kind of individual who lives in a world where you pay as you earn and you pay your taxes and pretty much everything that you are transmitting or 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 sharing is visible, then the idea of a digital currency just fits into that as an easier way to be able to to operate. If you have a more of a, an attachment to um, Anonymity. managing anonymity managing things in a particular way then that you know that's that's the polarized stereotype that, that kind of well, differentiates between where people sit on a cashless or a digital well that, that's the ironic thing because a lot of the proponents for bitcoin it was like you know it's it's kind of outside of the government so it can't be tra you know traced so I, I actually personally don't see much difference between a cbdc and 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 a, and a independent kind of uh, digital currency um so i was chatting with yeah, uh, the head of fin crime at a bank back in 2014, 2013, okay. right? So when, 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 when it was still quite, you know, um, the wild west of cryptos and digital currencies. Um, but even then at the bank, you know, the head of fin crime was saying, it's great, these digital currencies, blockchains, because there is traceability, there might be anonymity, but there is definitely traceability. So from a financial crown perspective, and you've seen, you've seen a lot of the fraud and, and people taking over Elon Musk's account and telling people to buy it. But they're catching them um, because they're traced. That they can follow, follow the, the money. Yeah. They can literally follow the money, right? And and there was there was the the, the big kind of big big one uh, announced in the summer. It was seven years after the um, you know the hack uh, of, the, of the exchange. They were able to kind of trace them. So um, yeah, actually, I think it's the other way around, right? It's uh, it's a, and it's a really good thing. So I'm excited to see what comes comes in that space. Keeps driving our industry forward. Yep. Right. And other news, um, mm. buy now, pay later. Mm. So, <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's, what's that sigh? What's that face? Uh, so um, I, I personally have a, a real um, thing about buy now, pay later. I know it's kind of been the, um, the industry way for a little while, being able to make a decision at point of purchase that you want to be able to spread the payments. And, and I think there's some really good reasons why that's helpful. And, and it's definitely driven up adoption and increased spending and a kind of size of basket and all of those other things. But I just have this really niggling doubt that it's pushing people into debt for something that they otherwise might have taken a different conscious decision on. And that's a very personal view. It's not the industry view. And I, and I know we provide buy now pay later products and they're hugely popular with consumers but well i mean there's there's a few things to unpack there i mean um before going into that but there are markets where there's you know bmpl a kind of installment at card and point of sale has been there for ages i think spain I know israel and, and other markets where it's you know you could have gone to 150 euro grocery shop they said do you want to split it into three so that's mm. been some of the, the, the there are markets in europe where this has been around for a long time and like years and decades and it hasn't but i think in general there's definitely built a reputation from from the bmpl side i see that and we've seen the consolidation a number of the big players who are shining lights in the last couple of years you know disappearing virtually overnight um which has been interesting to see if we could you know like i think zip shares um a firm a few others all, all kind of really really suffering badly um but given the current economic climate, there is definite consumer demand. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a movement from the BNPL market, which kind of was sat, sit in, sat in a little bit of a gap of unregulated finance to now more responsible finance, um, or, or sorry, not responsible finance, but responsible lending, which is in a regulated way. So there's some good players emerging there. I think you know, we're looking to partner with um, there. You know, I think, for example, Amazon just announced, I think, BNPL might be in the US. So anyone with Amazon Pay who've taken out an Amazon credit card. So they're leveraging the credit limit and the credit scoring that they've onboarded you and done, you know, regulated credit 
provisioning, but in a BNPL product kind of way, which is good. Consumer demand is going to be there just because we're living in a tough times at the moment. But definitely, we've got to be moving away from resp- you know, to, to more responsible lending, to more regulated lending. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how some of the pioneers of the BNPL space have evolved to, to the new world. I think Amazon's a useful, a, an interesting and mm. a useful case because, um, well, one, again, another mar- massive market dominant. So we're going to see a big spectrum of yeah. people experiencing that and, and working with it. And I do think on the plus side of buy now, pay later versus, say, credit card, the management of the repayments is much more planned. So you yeah. essentially take a mini loan and make repayments over a period as opposed to credit card where you sort of pay what you can and just keep having the yeah. um, uh, interest rates accelerate. It's a repayment plan, right. And often with 0% interest as well, which is which is uh, better. So, no, it's an interesting space also in the news. Um, we're hearing a lot about the rise of fraud. Uh, I, to me, I'm so confused because we, we're seeing in kind of, not old fashioned, but regular credit card fraud, stolen cards, chargebacks, I, I, with, with you know, strong customer authentication, 3DS 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, I can't mm. remember what we're up to, and you know, all of those, um, you know, we bought in some own tools with, with graph analysis. Yeah, I think we're seeing driving it down, but it's the one we won the award for, right? That is the one we won. We won the award for. We're nominated for a few others, but um, it's interesting. Again, you've got to really unpick the news when it says fraud driving and what, what, what you know what's driving this, because I don't think it's the the kind of traditional stolen credit card for, uh, you know, chargeback kind of stuff. I would agree with you, and, and we've seen both as consumers and as kind of industry bodies a massive change in chargebacks so the mm. the rules the process the experience of trying to raise this chargeback and the repercussions are really significant um i've already mentioned i'm an apple customer you i have uh, had a conversation with my bank um i didn't recognize a transaction i said in the heat of the conversation because we were talking about something else i just don't know what that transaction is they triggered a chargeback process and boy, did Apple come down on me with all, you know, like a ton of bricks um, because I had raised a chargeback right. against a transaction that was legitimate and I should have, you know, followed my terms and conditions and gone to their site and validated the transaction and all those good things. So I do think there's a huge level now of process and due diligence that's come in that wasn't there in the beginning. You could raise and get away with anything. So I think those behaviors have changed. But I also think that the industry's got better at authenticating, validating, um, demonstrating where the payment's gone. It's much harder to make those things up. But if I link perhaps some of the things you were talking about, uh, uh, I don't know, do they call it friendly fraud, where well, people was, deny that, that was, things that was have kind been of delivered? Example, though, that, that could be, that's, I think, Apple coming down on you. That's kind of the example because they knew that was legitimate, right? But, you, in your case, a genuine mistake, but mm. I think, right, it's it's people saying I didn't buy that, or I think now with with kind of so many things going to delivery, oh, I didn't get hasn't arrived, delivery hasn't arrived. Yeah, how much can you push it? I think I've heard there's you know there are forums and Telegram and other things, groups where you kind of share which merchants are going to kind of waive the fees or just deliver again and kind of oh you don't want to return it, but keep it. And, you know, and I think speaking to merchants and retailers, they're realizing there's there's a lot of money going getting lost there and they, 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 they're challenged with, we want to be a really good consumer friendly merchant, right? We don't want to penalize good, honest customers, but there's now some bad behaviors, you know, bad players coming in, you know, how do we manage that? How do we track it? You know, it's, it's super hard. And similarly, when they come out with promos and offers and taking, you know, there are, there are, people out there who are professionally looking, you know, figuring out how to milk those. Uh, and you know, it's a different type of online fraud. I think so when, when we see those headlines of fraud growing, it's, you know, I think we've probably from a pure payments perspective, we've, we've done a pretty good job and that's almost why it's pushing. You always know, say fraud just moves around, you never kill it. Right? Just look and for the soft spot. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and we're seeing it now in, in, in all these kind of areas. So it was, um, it's interesting to see what it really means when we see frauds growing and actually where it's being reduced. We were talking about the graph analysis actually with, um, I did a podcast not long ago with MasterCard and Wix, just oh, on, yeah. the whole, on the whole ecosystem, also, you know, and, and for merchants looking to um, 
expand digitally if they're coming from you know bricks and mortar into the world or even just going geogra geographically so it was you know topics there it, it, i think the number of players within the e-commerce ecosystem is really interesting from um cms platforms to content management platforms likes of um shopify magento woocommerce uh you know there's so many out there where merchants just expect payments to work they're looking for providers to have the right kind of plugins and not only that plugins which have all the bells and whistles and features and local payment methods alternative payment methods they're ready to switch on simply and easily well they've always been a, a useful element right yeah. the plugins provided a whole host of functionality to people but they've also now become hygiene factors for the industry they've been around so long so they really deliver that ability to manage and it's how we take that to the next level and deliver maybe interconnectivity with other systems such yep. as our orchestration layers so that we can really kind of drive flexibility for merchants and take them to that next level of sophistication. Well, that's an interesting point. So you talk about orchestration. So you look at the landscape of, of kind of, you know, merchants got to think about there are orchestration providers which sit outside of PSPs. There are open banking providers, which is again, sitting standalone. There's uh, subscription billing who don't who just manage subscription and billing and recurring payments, which is massively, again, a growth area for e-commerce. Um, and then you kind of, and then you've got the CMS content manager and all, you know, just hosted e-commerce platforms and ERP platforms. So poor merchant has to really work around a business to all of these. And I think, you know, looking at history repeating itself as a, as a payment provider who's come in and said, look, the stack needs to be unified and brought together from back in the noughties when it was just a gateway. One of the things we're doing is bringing that all in house. So orchestration rules within, within our gateway. So merchants don't need an independent or separate orchestration provider, which is another layer of cost and another layer of um, kind of point of failure. Um, bringing within its subscription billing management within within our tool and sometimes enhancing it within the widgets, depending if the, if the um, e-commerce platform supports it. And again, open banking, which we talked about, but I think competitively or economically serve businesses and make you know, open banking cheap enough, et cetera. It's only, it's only a slight volume of payments, right? So bringing it within a platform where you can pay by card, different payment method, or open banking um, you know, through the same, you know, same platform, same same account management. I think the long-term growth and success of all of that, it needs to be brought together for economies of scale. Absolutely. And um, we understand that because we work in the business. Yeah. And we understand um, all of the words that you just used it's and true. how they yeah. all kind of come together and, and what, what that means for individual merchants. And I think if you're a, a large-scale merchant with a kind of dedicated payment specialist or specialists within your team, mm. then again, yes, you would expect to have that kind of really detailed level of understanding. But I think where the, the opportunity sits for the industry is in how does that then wash down to the, the smaller merchants and how do they start to take advantage of some of those, those capabilities? And a lot of what you described, although 100% accurate, is just bamboozling to them in terms of, of of what exists so you know they're they're told by one person oh you you need these different layers um and then as you say you've kind of got more people in the value chain and and how does that all sit together so deciding what functionality adds the best value for your organization and the way that you want to work and then understanding architecturally how can you best deliver that to get the most seamless relay race or set of transitions which is what our orchestration stack is doing kind of reducing the the handovers to make that a better experience those are the things that we need to be helping those smaller merchants who have huge potential for growth to understand because otherwise the kind of the marketing blurb gets really difficult for them yeah. to, to to kind of drill through the noise and understand well, look, we're what, here to, what, what it even means we're here to make the complex stuff simple no. It like there's been a ton of stuff happening. Um, actually, did you see yesterday the news? That Barclays could be looking to sell the payments on the business, like Barclays Card. Really, they were the last of the the big stands. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. And like you know, because you had WorldPay, FIS, and then bought by Fiverr, and uh, like say FIS. Well, even before that, right? RBS sold off. Yeah. What was Streamline? Then that became WorldPay. Well, now FIS have sold World well, well back to being independent, but but Barclays, I thought that was fascinating. The news, it'd be not so surprising, but it's uh, interesting to see what comes of that one. Could uh, do with an injection of new life, though. I think really, it's one of the last traditional players that 
hasn't really innovated at the same level as the rest of the market and doesn't make them competitive. I think any, but all the legacy platforms are challenged with, with some of the new next generation payment providers coming in, right? And what they really need is a new tech stack. And it's so hard supporting the volume of clients they do, how do they implement it? And, and the bigger you get, the harder it is to kind of, you, know, you lose that agility to implement it in, so. You need design for purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I'm interested to see who you kind of, who's interested in buying them. Um, maybe the new independent will pay. Maybe. I'm not sure what the competition's authority is actually in the UK. It would probably be... Yeah, too, too much of a domination. Yeah. But maybe one for us to, uh, to, to, to mull over outside of this conversation. Over, over a glass of wine, <laughs> absolutely. But so just finishing off, any predictions 2024? Coming towards the end of the year? I don't think 2024 is going to be a year of revolution. No. But I think it is going to be a year of continued evolution. Are we going to see VRPs finally emerge at all? Variable recurring payments from uh, banking? Yeah, I think, really? though, yes, I, I think a confirmation of payee, knowing that you have definitely not oh, only for sure. paid yeah. the right person, but, you know, that that person's received the funds. Variable recurring payments, which is essentially the best substitute for direct debit, because you can pay a different yeah, amount, yeah. hence the variable, but you can pay it on a recurring basis. So. Mm -hmm. Um, if if you get the jargon, it's it's all good. Um, and then the whole faster payments, instant payment, separate instance delivery, all of those things combined with the expansion into real use cases that add value to people will start to drive more people into the fold of wanting to do transactions. So I do think there's more of what we've seen to come, more growth, more expansion, um, but, you know, a bigger snowball rather than a, a, yeah. a monumental shift. Yeah, no, no major revolutions. Like I, I, I think the the Apple tap to pay is going to be super cool, and we're going to see that build up probably faster than we think. So I'll be interested to end of next year where we are. That's that's exciting to me. I think also you know we've talked about already for a year or two social commerce, which is coming over from Asia. But you know, um, I think that payment links and being able to transact within. WhatsApp or mm. is there use Facebook anymore or Meta? I don't know, but only old people. Oh, I don't know, but you know, um, you know, TikTok and all those kind of things. The social commerce, yeah, especially TikTok's really pushing hard, and that I think that's we should we'll probably see a decent shift and 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 some progress on that next year. So exciting, but yeah, it's it's more you know snow snowball gaining momentum. Having said that, though, I believe we we sat down again next month. There's just so much news cropping up. Um, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be interesting to to see and review what's happened in the last month again. Look forward to it. Thank you all for listening. Thanks, Claire. It, it was always a pleasure and enlightening uh, having a chat with you on payments. Thanks for inviting me to have the conversation. Really enjoyed it. Um, sometimes it's good to to kick the tires on what's happening in the industry. And um, as you said, it's it's one that's constantly changing and yeah, depending on your point of view, incredibly fascinating. So. Yeah, look forward to the next conversation. Yeah. Until next time. Next time. <laughs>